The wisdom of God includes the act of preaching. We find in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21, that the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Obviously, in the preaching that Paul is speaking of, it's going to include that plan that God has set forth to save sinful mankind. And in previous lessons, we've noted the need for that. And that God's omniscience, He knew that man would commit sin. And in that sinful condition, He was spiritually dead, in need of thus reconciliation to Him. Thus, God planned a way to save sinful mankind from His sins. That eternal purpose of God was found in the salvation of man through Jesus Christ in the church. And God then started revealing that plan to man, that scheme of redemption. And so when we look at that scheme of redemption, we realize there's that aspect of God's part, and that is the grace that we have even been discussing the fact that God planned a way to save sinful mankind and that He gave His Son to die upon the cross and that the blood that He shed there would save man from his sins. But then there's also man's part in that salvation. That man needs to hear the word which God has set forth because Christianity is first and foremost a teaching religion and a learned religion. There's that aspect of teaching and learning. And in order to have faith, the faith that is necessary to save us, we must, because it comes by hearing God's Word, we must hear God's Word. But then that aspect of faith, we noted the necessity of it. There, You just cannot go through the Scriptures without seeing numerous times in which there's the need for faith. But while some claim that faith is some type of a gift that God gives us, the Scriptures show that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And thus the origin of faith, it comes from the Scriptures. It comes from having a evidence set forth for us whereby we can, come, we can make that decision that God is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again according to the Scriptures. We also noted that faith, as far as what it means, a definition, is not some leap of faith as many talk about today and making a distinction between knowledge and faith, but instead faith is equated with knowledge and is based upon knowledge. We know something, we reason correctly concerning the evidence that has been provided for us, which is the Word of God, and through that evidence that has been provided, we come to faith. And faith then must be acted upon. But this morning, we want to notice the next step in that scheme or that plan that God has set forth, and that is that man must repent of his sins. In repentance, there is the need for understanding that we have committed sin. First three chapters of Romans really deals with this very subject as really the entire book is dealing with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that the just thus shall live by faith, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And to start his exposition in dealing with that theme, he begins the first three chapters, actually chapter 1 and verse 18 through the end of the chapter, dealing with the Gentile world, how that they had committed sin. Even though they did not have God's written revelation, they should have known God by the invisible things that are shown of God. We can see His eternal power in Godhead. So that they were without excuse, they committed sin. 
chapter 2, he turns to the Jewish people. And he says, you're no better than they. They had, you had unto you, committed unto you the oracles of God. And yet you did exactly the same things that the Gentile world did. And so chapter 3 sums it up. For example, in verse 10, he, by quoting the psalmist, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, again, he makes that summary statement, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so chapter 3, that is the summation of chapters 1 and 2. Gentiles have sinned, Jews have sinned, none are, are righteous. Everyone has committed sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 22, Paul would say, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The Scriptures, or the Scripture, hath concluded. Now notice, the Scripture finds its origin in God, St. Thessalon- Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Thus, when it says the Scriptures hath concluded, we can substitute the idea God's conclusion is. All have sinned. All are under sin. The Scriptures teach us that. In fact, one of the purposes of the Old Testament law was to reveal sin to a man. And that's Romans 7th chapter, uh, verses 1 and following. And in verse 7, he specifically states, I had not known sin except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet is part of the Ten Commandments. And he's showing how that, the, that old law has been done away with, but the purpose of the law was to reveal sin to him. We can come to a knowledge that we have committed sin based upon the Old Testament. That's one of the purposes of it. And so now then, the Scriptures thus, their conclusion is all are under sin. All individuals have committed sin. With repentance, there's the idea then that is within man With that realization, I have committed sin, there then needs to be the desire to live according to God's revealed will. We see the necessity of repentance when Jesus says in Luke the 13th chapter, first in verse 3 and then repeated in verse 5, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now there, he used two common illustrate or not common but illustrations of that day calamities that had taken place at that time that they knew of and he makes a conclusion based upon it unless you repent while there was that calamity that came upon those individuals you're all going to perish unless you repent and so there's a need we see the necessity of repentance In Luke 24, verse 46 and 47, thus, as Jesus is giving, as Luke records, the Great Commission to his apostles to go into all the world, preach the gospel, Luke's record of that is, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so there was a beginning point of that preaching of the gospel, Jerusalem, but it was to be preached among all nations. What was it? Need for repentance and the fact of having the remission of sins. But the need for repentance is seen in the very fact that Jesus in that great commission says, you go into all the world preaching this. The need for repentance. As... The Apostle Paul was before the Athenians in Acts 17th chapter. And he is declaring unto them the unknown God whom they ignorantly worshipped. He comes to what becomes basically the conclusion of his lesson in verses 30 and 31, that the times of this ignorance God winked at or overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repent. 
because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And us, he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now that's inclusive of everyone, even today. Every person has the obligation given by God to repent. Now then, he sets forth the reason for that, the need for repentance. And that is the judgment that's going to come. Because there's a day that has been appointed that God's going to judge the world. Those realize eschatologists that teach that the judgment has already passed, they have removed the very need for repentance from the Scriptures. There is no need to repent if the judgment's already taken place. The very fact that you, there is a judgment to come demands the fact that we as humans today need to repent. He says that that judgment's going to take place in righteousness. Well, the righteousness of God has been revealed in the Scriptures, what we saw in Romans 1, 16 and 17. It's going to be a done by Christ, the one whom he hath raised from the dead. And we have assurance of that coming judgment and the very fact that he was raised from the dead. But all of verse 31 finds its basis upon verse 30 that of our need to repent. Man needs to repent. There's, here's the reason why, the judgment. But there's that need for repentance on man's part. No wonder Jesus would tell the apostles, preach repentance to all people, all nations everywhere. But what is repentance? This is where many times we find difficulty in understanding what the Scriptures teach. Repentance involves several aspects. First, it is honestly, fervently, sincerely seeking the favor of God. It is a heart that says, I want to please God. I want to seek His favor. I want to do what He says. Now, the seeking of that pleasure is going to be done first by having godly sorrow. There is a sorrow that is of the world. That's not what we're talking about. We can be sorrowful for a lot of things, but that's not necessarily godly sorrow. I can be sorry that I got caught doing something I wasn't supposed to do. That's not necessarily godly sorrow. That's sorrow that I got caught, not sorrow that I did something wrong. I might be sorry that I offended someone and what I did, but that's not necessarily godly sorrow. There's a lot of aspects of sorrow that man has that is not necessarily godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is produced by a realization of guilt and condemnation. I stand guilty. One of the problems when some individuals repent of their sins, they come forward and confess their sins, that they have committed sin, they will instead put it in a conditional sense. If I have sinned, or if I have hurt anyone's feeling, or caused heartache, or if I've done this, if I've done that, well, true repentance is based upon a realization of guilt. I have committed sin. It's not if, it's not a, well, there's the possibility of it, but there's also the possibility of not having done it. This is a realization. I have committed sin. But in a realization of our guilt and condemnation also has to come from a knowledge of God's law. I have transgressed God's law. Well, I have to know what God's law is in order to know whether or not I've transgressed it. 
whether I stand guilty before God. And so there has to be that knowledge of God's law in relationship to repentance. There also, and that godly sorrow is produced by an abiding faith and love of God and His will. I have a love for God, therefore I'm going to repent of what I've been doing. And we'll get more into that aspect of repentance, but it's, there's that faith and love of God that causes me to have godly sorrow. And then there's also that abiding, that sincere sense of personal responsibility. One of the great tragedies in our society today, even within the church, is this idea of blaming everyone else and the avoiding of personal responsibilities. We see it in our court system. This made me do it. That made me do it. And we've blamed all of these things that supposedly caused me to do this instead of taking a personal responsibility. I have made the choice to do it. We make a choice within our life to serve God or to serve other things, to do other things. To be, we make a choice whether we're going to be obedient or whether we're not going to be obedient. We need to make or we do make the choice, we need to have the personal responsibility that comes along with the choice that we've made and accept that personal responsibility instead of trying to avoid it. Pass the buck. And yes, I know it's something that's been from the very creation of the world, man trying to pass the buck. You know, Eve said, well, the serpent made me do it, passing the buck. Adam said, the woman which you gave. So he tried to pass the buck both to the woman and to God. Instead of accepting personal responsibility, repentance and godly sorrow that is necessary in that repentance comes as a result of understanding a personal responsibility and accepting that personal responsibility. Now then, that godly sorrow is going to cause us a turning from our sinful way of life. It is as if we are walking one way and we have stopped. We realize our sin. We're taking personal responsibility because we know we have offended the very nature, the holy nature of God. And so we stop and we have that abiding love and that desire to do God's will. And so there is a turning from that sinful way in which we've been walking. This turning from that sinful way, though, that you've been walking isn't a turning to maybe one side or to another side or to this way or that way. It has to be a turning to God in God's way. If I'm walking down this aisle here, I started to do that instead, and I get about three-quarters of the way down, and I stop, and I turn to the right, and I go through the pews, whereas God's way is this way, coming back. I might have changed, but I've not changed to in the way that God wants me to change. Or if I change and turn to the left and go to the left side, Again, I've changed, I've turned, but I've not turned in God's way. We have to, true repentance is a turning to God, but doing so in the way in which He has set forth. Now then, that is going to be based upon our desire to do right and to be right. I want to be right with God. Thus, I don't change just over here or here or some other way. I turn around, and I'm now going to walk in God's way, and I'm going to do what God says. 
a desire to be right and to do right. And that leads to that thus change of action, that change in life. It's going to be seen as we turn around our life, we change our life because of that desire to be right and do right. And then we make restitution as far as possible and in whatever righteous way is possible. For example, we've used illustration. If I've stolen somebody's car, I can't say, well, I'm going to repent and keep the car. It doesn't work that way. We've got to set things right. That's what part of repentance is dealing with, setting things back in the right way. And that takes restitution. Now, we realize that we can't restore someone's life, but we might be able to make some part of restitution even in the taking of someone's life. Not that we restore the life, but that they might have had a family that needs taken care of. Or they might have had some project that they needed completing. Or they needed something else. There might be something in that life that we can help set right, even though we cannot restore the life. Restitution is very simply setting things in their proper order. And so if you've stolen something, you return it. That's an illustration of what repentance is dealing with. Restitution. Making things right. That's part of repentance. You can't truly repent without making the proper restitution as far as humanly possible and in the righteous way, a way that is right, that is set forth by God. But repentance is something that is absolutely essential to one's salvation. You cannot be saved without repentance. But another step is that man must confess his faith. In Romans 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10, Paul would write that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let me just uh, briefly state something in relationship to this verse and a new translation that is being um, oftentimes uh, used today and encouraged, the English Standard Version. When it gets to these words in Romans 10, 9 and 10, or verse 10 in particular, Instead of saying unto, it says, well, here it is, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If one is justified and is saved at that point, then there's no need for baptism. That completes the action. You see, it's an incorrect translation. Because the word that's used here is looking forward to. That's the idea that is being set forth. It's not something that is, that is present tense. It's something that is looking forward to something. We are looking forward unto being righteous or justified. We are looking forward unto salvation, not something that is a present possession, which is the verb is. And so you have to be careful with some of these modern translations. And the ESV, while it's good in most places, there are these areas in which you have to be very careful with, and this does is one of those areas that teaches false doctrine. But there is in these verses the need for confession. 
The word confess, with the mouth confession, is made unto salvation. It comes from the Greek word homologia, and that's made up of two parts. The first part is homeo, and that means same. We know that word probably today best from the idea of homosexual. A homosexual is one who is of the same sex, desires one of the same sex. Well, that sameness comes from that first part, homo. Homo here, legeo, which is the latter part, lego, which means word. And so while homosexual deals with same sex, homologeo means same word. It is thus to say the same thing as someone else. That's the idea of this word confess. And in this situation, it is saying the same word as the father. Well, what did the Father say? When we go back to Matthew, the third chapter, Jesus has now come to John the Baptist to be baptized of him, to fulfill all righteousness. And while John initially says, no, I have need to be baptized of you, he goes ahead, and because of Jesus' response, he, ba he baptizes him. After the completion of that baptism, as he comes up out of the water, it says at verse 17, Lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so here the Father is out of this with a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son. Adds the fact that he is well pleased in him. Why is he well pleased? Because he was obedient to the Father's will. But the statement is, this is my son. Later on, uh, as Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up into a mountain and is transfigured before them, Peter waking out of sleep with the other two, but Peter becomes the spokesman, as is so often the case, and he says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And it says in Matthew 17 and verse 5, that while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud uh, overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So again, we have a voice out of heaven. The Father is making a statement concerning Jesus of Nazareth. What is it? This is my Son. And again, he adds this, I am well pleased with him. Why again? Because he continues to do the will of the Father. But then he adds in this occasion, hear him. There were no longer we to hear Moses or Elijah, great lawgiver, the prophet of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is being done away with. It's passing away. And a New Testament, a new covenant is going to come, and we're going to have to hear Christ. It's amazing that we have some brethren, though, who come along and say, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament doctrine, and all Jesus was doing is explaining the law of Moses in a correct manner. If that's the case, then we shouldn't hear Christ either, because we're not under that law any longer. In fact, we, as today, were never under it. The Jews were during that period, we were never under it as Gentiles. And we've never lived under the law of Moses. But according to that, we shouldn't hear Christ either. Because that was something that was never given to us and that we were never subject to. No, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are part of the New Testament. That new law. And thus we are to hear Him. 
But we have what the Father said. This is my son. That's what Jesus is stating concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now then, we confess. What is it? We have a word together with God. God has said, this is my son. Jesus of Nazareth is my son. What do we do? We say the same thing as God. In Caesarea Philippi, Jesus with his apostles asked them, whom do men say that I am? They gave some of the thoughts of that day. He turns to them and asks, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers in Matthew 16 and verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was confessing. He was saying the same thing that the Father had said. The Father said, Jesus of Nazareth, this is my Son. Peter is now saying, when Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's saying the exact same thing that the Father had said. He was confessing. Thus, we would read, and as we discussed a little bit this morning in the Bible class, in Acts the 8th chapter, here's the Ethiopian And he is reading Isaiah 53, Isaiah the prophet. And Philip explains and begins in Isaiah 53, and one of the great things that we learn about that is that all of the scriptures center upon Christ. You go back into the Old Testament, you read the Old Testament prophets, you read the uh, law, you read all of the things from Genesis on through Malachi, and all of it is pointing to Christ. That's one of the great lessons he preached Christ from what? From Isaiah 53. And by the way, another great lesson we learn is that those individuals under the Old Testament many times didn't understand what they were saying and what they were writing. We see that in 1 Peter 1, verse 10 through verse 12. When even the angels desired to look into that salvation of which things the prophets wrote about, but they wrote for our admonition, not for their own admonition, but for our admonition. And our learning. Well, here's Isaiah, 700 years before Christ. And he's writing about Christ. And so Philip was able to begin at that point and preach Christ unto him. They come to water. Philip, or the eunuch, says, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip's statement, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What did he do? He said the same thing that God had said. The Father had said, Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The same confession that Peter made, thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And now then, this Ethiopian is saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's making that same statement that the Father had made, the same statement that Peter had made. And if you notice in in Matthew 16, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto you. How How was it revealed? The Father in heaven revealed the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. How did he do that? By the evidences that he had set forth. The miracles that he had performed. The obedience that he had, he had done throughout his life. were proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so the Father revealed it unto you not by some still small voice or anything along that line, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ and the actions that he did, the miracles that he performed. He was truly, as Peter would say on the day of Pentecost, he was a man that was approved of God among you by the miracles, signs, and wonders that he did, Acts 2 and verse 22. 
And now then, because Peter had been able to see those things, he was able to make that confession. We today are able to read about those things and we have the evidence that is available to us to bring us to faith and now then we have a knowledge I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and so we make that confession of our faith because it's necessary it's needed to be saved it is truly unto salvation looking forward to the salvation that can come through that one who is the Son of God, that one who is God manifested in the flesh. Now, if you have not believed in Him, repented of your sins, and made that great confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, and then, as we'll study, Lord willing, next week, been baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, then that's what you need to do in order to be saved in order to have this salvation that God planned before the world began, that he was going to reconcile man, sinful man, unto himself through the death of Jesus Christ in the church. And when we're baptized into Christ, then God adds us to the church of which Christ built and established and purchased. So if you've not done that, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. If you have, but you've you've wandered away from that truth, no longer living in the type of life that God wants you to live, and you realize your need to come back and to repent, even as Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8th chapter realized his need to repent and to pray. And well, let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can enjoy the salvation that is found in Christ. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.